Hello and welcome everyone. We're going to get started here at the top of the hour. So, uh, so grab some, some water and uh, get ready to learn uh, about the American Red Cross, uh, the ICRC and the Red Cross movement uh, here at uh, noon. All right, so it is at the top of the hour. Hello and welcome to this webinar. Today we'll be talking about the Red Cross movement origins and the roots uh, of the movement on the battlefield. I am joined today by my fellow IHL intern here at the Amer Red American Red Cross, Amelia Steffen. I am also joined by uh, Jamina Shikani from the American Red Cross Restoring Family Links team and uh, Kasuke Onishi from the International Committee of the Red Cross. So a little bit about uh, the team here. Uh, we focus on international humanitarian law and we are the main uh, people who share IHL to the general public here in the US. Uh, so what is IHL? So IHL goes by a few names, uh, the law of armed conflict, the laws of war, and these are uh, the set of rules that seek to inject humanity into war. Uh, they set protections that all parties to conflicts must obey. Um, so before we get into the presentation, please feel free to use the chat. If you have any questions, drop those in the Q&A, and uh, hopefully we can get to some of those later on in the presentation. So you may be wondering, why are we uh, talking about this today? So today is World Red Cross and Red Crescent Day. And that happens every year on May 8th as the founder of the movement, Henri Dunant, uh, this was his birthday. Okay, so on the screen, you'll see uh, a few symbols. Uh, and these are the three modernly recognized uh, symbols uh, for the movement. So you have the red cross there on the left. In the middle, you have the red crescent. And on the right, you have the red crystal, which is recognized as 2005. And so international law protects people who wear these symbols and the buildings and transport which display them. These people and objects aren't parties to the conflict, but they are there to help anyone who needs help. So who makes up the movement? So there are a few different parts, um, and you'll hear from a few of those areas today. Uh, so in total, there's about 15 million people worldwide that are part of the movement. This makes the uh, uh, Red Cross movement the largest humanitarian work in the world. So starting uh, on the right, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, who you'll hear about more later from uh, Kasuke, is also known as the ICRC. Uh, their mission is based on the Geneva Convention of 1949, their additional protocols, its statutes, and the resolutions of the International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. The organization is independent and neutral. It promotes respect for IHL and its implementation in national law. The American Red Cross 
um, is one of 192 national societies of the movement, and they provide disaster relief and humanitarian need, both domestically and internationally. And then in the middle, we won't hear from anybody today, but just know that the International Federation of the Red Cross, or the IFRC, uh, is the world's largest humanitarian network comprising the 192 National Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies um, that work to save lives, build community resilience, strengthen localization, and promote dignity around the world. The IFRC and its 192 national societies work to prevent the, uh, and lessen uh, the impacts of crises, uh, disasters, uh, with a focus on saving lives, reduce suffering, and upholding human dignity. Like I said, you'll hear more on the current roles of the ICRC and the American Cross later in this presentation. So before we get into the foundation of the movement, it's important to talk about uh, what the movement really stands for. And so on the screen, you see the seven fundamental principles of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement that we are celebrating here today. And so these seven principles are at the heart, at the core of the movement's approach to people during times of armed conflicts, natural disasters, and other emergencies. So I'm going to give just a brief discussion, on, or a brief uh, highlight of what these various uh, uh, principles are. So starting off at the top, humanity. So this is the main principle that under uh, underlies all of the others. Um, and it's essentially that uh, humanity, uh, uh, we seek to prevent and alleviate, alleviate suffering of all people um, during times of crises. Uh, so next below that is impartiality. And that is essentially that there's uh, no discrimination for providing relief, um, for relieving uh, that suffering. Neutrality um, is again something that is very noticeable about the Red uh, Red Cross Red Crescent movement that we don't take sides in hostilities um, or other controversies, political, religious. Uh, we just uh, remind parties of their obligations, and and, and uh, you'll hear more about that later. Um, next is independence. Um, so while um, the national societies often work alongside the government or work alongside the military of, of the different states that they're um, within. Uh, it's important that the Red Cross remain autonomous and independent from uh, the state to which they are in. Uh, voluntary service. I am a volunteer here at the Amer American Red Cross. So are uh, a lot of uh, people within the movement. And it's essentially that people are not prompted by desire for gain, and uh, that helps fuel uh, the passion for the movement and keeps a lot of priorities straight. Uh, just two more, I promise you. So unity within any given country, there is only going to be one Red Cross or Red Crescent Society that is open to all people within that country. Um, and that's to keep a single uh, mission focused approach. And then lastly, universality, all national societies have equal status um, and share equal responsibilities um, for helping each other. And this one's really important because there's a universality of suffering that requires us to take a universal response to that. To that. Um, so you should have a link there um, to an ICRC um, discussion on these principles that I think is really useful. So I'm gonna transition now to uh, Amelia, who's going to tell us about the founding of the movement. Hi, hey everybody. So today we celebrate World Red Cross and Red Crescent Day because of the man, Henry Dunant, whose vision led to the creation of the Red Cross. And his life prior to the founding of the Red Cross um, was one of wealth. He was born into a wealthy family. Um, and then after he finished schooling in 1853, he traveled to Algeria to work as a businessman for the Swiss colony of Satif. And during his time in Algeria, he acquired some land and began the construction of a wheat mill, but he needed water rights um, for this land and to actually get the wheat mill going. And this problem is really what starts the chain of events that lead to the founding of the Red Cross, because do not decides that to solve his issue to get his water rights, he is going to approach Napoleon III directly because he needed Napoleon III to give him the paperwork to get these water rights. But at the time, um, Napoleon III was leading French troops at the Battle of Solferino um, against the Austrian army. 
And so um, Henry Dunant makes his way from Algeria up to Solferino to ask Napoleon III for these water rights. Um, next slide, please. So the Battle of Solferino um, takes place in 1859 um, on June 24th. And like I said, it was the Italians and the French um, versus the Austrians. And it was in a war for Italian unification. And a fun fact about this battle is that it was purported to be the last major battle in world history where all the armies were under the personal command of their monarchs. But this battle involved over 300,000 soldiers. It lasted for 15 hours, and it began at about 3 or 4 in the morning. And by the end of the 15 hours, there were 38,000 casualties, wounded and killed, and thousands of soldiers were left on the battlefield, wounded without medical support or food. So Henry Dunant arrives, and he sees that this absolute tragedy and... Um, is horrified by what is going on. Um, and so he goes and he um, leads a group of women and people in the near nearby villages and towns um, to come and take care of those who were left on the battlefield and who need medical care. Uh, this is because um, at the time they were taking the soldiers, the nearest place where they could have medical care was about six miles away, and they didn't have enough carts to get all the soldiers to um, the medical camp. And so many soldiers were left on the battlefield for up to or longer than three days, and they needed food and they needed water and they needed to be taken care of. Um, and so after Solferino, Dunant published the short book um, in 1862, The Battle of Solferino, and the book details the absolute horrendous suffering endured during and after the conflict um, by these soldiers. And of particular mention is Dunant's firsthand account of the lack of humanitarian services available to the wounded soldiers. And like I said, many of whom were unable to move or access food or water. And so he describes the plight of these soldiers and the relief efforts initiated by locals and himself. And if you haven't had a chance um, to read this uh, book, I would definitely recommend taking a look at it. Um, it's pretty short, it's only about 150 pages, but it really is a very vivid account of what happened um, at Solferino and how important it is um, to have humanitarian services. And the book is, put, um, is cut into three parts. The first is a description of the battle. The second is a description of the tragedy after the battle of all the injuries. And then the third is a call to action. And Henry Dunant proposes that there should be a creation of a neutral humanitarian organization. And this proposition eventually becomes the ICRC. Next slide, please. So the ICRC, um, after the ICRC is founded, um, we uh, from that comes the 1864 Geneva Convention. Um, so at the time, uh, there were 12 signatories and 57 ratifiers, and the 1864 Geneva Convention had three main principles. The first principle was relief to the wounded without any distinction as to nationality. The second involved neutrality of medical personnel and medical establishments and units. And the third was that the distinctive sign on the, of the Red Cross on a white background, and this was to signify the humanitarian aid workers and humanitarian camps. So the 1864 Geneva Convention was built upon and, super, and superseded um, by subsequent Geneva Conventions, such as that as 1906, 1929, and the 1949 Geneva Conventions, which we are um, more familiar with today. Um, however, it is an interesting um, fact that the 1864 Geneva Convention was actually still in effect until 1966, and that is because the Republic of Korea, which was one of the original 57 ratifiers of the 1864 Geneva Convention, didn't ratify the 1949 Geneva Convention until 1966. And so it was in 1966 that the 1864 Geneva Convention was officially superseded. And with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Hunter to discuss um, the founding of the American Red Cross. Thank you so much, Amelia, for uh, giving us that brief introduction to the founding of the movement. So that is the, the beginning of uh, the ICRC and their work. And I'm going to be talking about the founding of the American Red Cross. So it all starts with really this, this one amazing woman um, who is um, iconic to, to most people who take an American history class. Uh, so this is Clara Barton. She was born on, on uh, December 5th or Christmas Day, 1821. 
in Massachusetts. Uh, so she she grows up in the, in the Northeast and she eventually moves down uh, to Washington, D.C., where she is one of the first women to work for the federal government. She's worked, she worked for the uh, U.S. Patent Office. Uh, um, and she's still in D.C. Uh, whenever the, the uh, American Civil War comes around um, and she becomes a nurse and she, she's bit, she goes to several of these battlefields, uh, including Antietam, where she sees uh, lots of uh, death and destruction, and she is uh, just trying to help people through this. Um, so she uh, becomes known as the angel of the battlefields um, and does a really remarkable job of just helping people um, during such a, a bloody internal conflict. Um, so she eventually goes and asks President Lincoln um, soon be, uh, before his death for approval to create the Office of Missing Soldiers. Um, uh, and this is a, a really cool story where she ultimately identified over 20,000 people for their families, um, including 13,000 of which who had died as uh, prisoners of war at the uh, infamous Andersonville prison in Georgia. Uh, and so this discovery um, led to others to refer to her as the heroine of Andersonville. Uh, so after the American Civil War, uh, she travels to Europe um, in 1869, uh, where she goes to Geneva and she meets with the Red Cross Foundation. While she's in Europe, uh, she gets requested um, by some governments to help serve as a nurse um, with their established Red Crosses during the Franco and Prussian War, um, where she's delivering food, supplies, and aid uh, to civilians and soldiers. And after that, she comes back to the States and she sees the the promise and the good of having an established humanitarian organization so she goes to uh the president uh Rutherford B. Hayes at the time and uh, she asks him to uh ratify the 1864 Geneva Conventions he sees this as a an entanglement with European alliances and he says no so he refuses to to submit it to the senate for ratification uh she then goes to uh, President Garfield after he's elected, and he seems interested. <laughs> but um, as some will know, he was assassinated only 81 days into his uh, first uh, uh, term. So he is unable to submit it for ratification. She then goes to his replacement, Chester Arthur, and he says yes. And the U.S. then ratified uh, the 1864 uh, Geneva Conventions in 1882. Uh, becoming one of those 57 ratifiers that Amelia pointed out. Um, and then, so, but right before this, uh, she helped, uh, founded the American Red Cross on May 21st, 1881. So just in a couple of weeks, we'll be celebrating the anniversary of that um, here at the Red Cross. And I, I just found this, this quote of hers that I really enjoy. Um, and it comes from a, a longer uh, section, but I, I definitely recommend uh, people to to look a little bit into her. Um, and so that was sort of the, the original founding of uh, the American Cross and sort of the U.S. involvement in uh, recognizing IHL and, and so on. And so this is a poster from World War I, um, which is when the American Cross introduced its first aid, water safety, and public health nursing programs. Um, and this, this period also led to just phenomenal growth um, of the organization. So local chapters were, were created en masse. Um, membership grew to over 20 million adults and 11 million junior members. Um, Within within a year, they had raised four hundred million uh, dollars at that time uh, for for the organization, which is just incredible to think about how that translates to today. Um, but during World War One, over twenty thousand uh, Red Cross nurses uh, served along the battle um, in support of the U.S. forces, um, which is really just incredible. Thinking that the U.S. was only in World War One for the the last few months of the war. Um, but even in that time, there was uh, a really large involvement. And that takes us forward to the next World War, World War II, uh, where the Red Cross enrolled uh, 104,000 nurses for military service. Um, so serving alongside the military um, in, in that uh, relief role. Um, for this, the, uh, the American Red Cross also prepared 27 million packages for American and allied prisoners of war. And they shipped over 300,000 tons of supplies overseas. 
It is also during this time that the government comes to the American Red Cross and asks them to create a blood program for the use by the armed forces, um, which they found to be wildly successful and popular. And so after the war, um, the American Red Cross uh, expanded this program to the civilian blood program that uh, most people associate with the Red Cross today. Um, so that is our brief introduction into the foundation uh, of both the International Committee of the Red Cross and uh, the American Red Cross. So next we are going to be discussing the current roles of uh, these two organizations. Uh, so we're going to start and I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming uh, Kasuke Onishi of the ICRC and he's going to be uh, uh, telling us about their current role. Thank you, Hunter. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and happy World Red Cross and Red Crescent Day to everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, thank you uh, for organizing this event, uh, and thank you for inviting the ICRC to speak about our role with respect to IHL. Uh, so today, I've been asked uh, to briefly talk about what the ICRC does uh, with respect to IHL, both outside before an armed conflict takes place, but also to demystify a bit what the ICRC does during armed conflict. Before doing so, I ought to briefly mention, you know, what is the ICRC and, and what does it do operationally? So here we are. We have the first slide here. Uh, thank you, Hunter. And uh, as you can see, the ICRC is a two-hatted organization. So it has an operational hat, and then it also has the IHL hat, which is to promote and strengthen international humanitarian law with a view to preventing suffering. And it does this in tandem with the national societies such as the American Red Cross. Um, so on the operational side, if we can go to the next slide, I'm just going to briefly talk about what we mean by protect and assist uh, in armed conflicts. So um, assistance, uh, you'll see that on the right side there uh, is the provision of goods and services. Think of water, food, medicine, non-food essentials such as clothing, but also helping to maintain infrastructure and uh, improving resilience, economic security through cash assistance, et cetera. And this is a non-exhaustive list. The list goes on. And if you want to learn more, uh, it's available on our website and, and on our reports of what we uh, do uh, across the world. The photo on the right there you'll see is a photo from Ukraine in 2014 uh, with ICRC providing assistance to rebuild uh, housing that had been damaged in the armed conflict. On the protection side, uh, generally speaking, protection can be defined as activities to ensure that authorities or other actors respect their obligations and the rights of individuals. And this is where IHL comes into play, but I should mention that protection goes further than that, and it's toward uh, addressing not only potential IHL violations, but also humanitarian consequences more generally. Classic protection activities conducted by the ICRC are detention visits, uh, traditionally to prisoners of war, although that's becoming less common uh, because most of the armed conflicts today are non-international and they don't uh, involve uh, prisoners of war. However, there are many detainees uh, still being detained across the armed, armed conflict. It's a reality of armed conflict and detention visits are ongoing. Um, other activities, our protection of civilians, including, uh, excuse me, protection of the civilian population and recording violations of IHL in the conduct of hostility, so basically during war fighting. And then another core activity under the protection umbrella is the protecting and restoring of family links. So tracing uh, separated families, passing Red Cross messages, assisting in reunification uh, where possible. The photo there on the left is a photograph of an ICRC delegate, an engineer to be precise, in Mali uh, discussing the ventilation system of a uh, detention facility. So discussing about not only the treatment during detention, but also the, uh, uh, the suitability of the facilities and the conditions of detention more generally fall under uh, the ambit of protection. Um, and ICRC does this in accordance with the principles of impartiality, neutrality, and independence. Hunter did an excellent job of going over these principles, so I think we'll skip those for now uh, and go on to the next slide, if possible. So 
what does the ICRC do under its second hat, its hat relating to international humanitarian law? Well, I've split this presentation into two parts. As mentioned, activities we do outside of armed conflict, so when no armed conflict is taking place, and during armed conflict. So starting with activities that we do uh, when there's no armed conflict, um, we disseminate and we develop. Uh, those are the two main buckets that if you take that away today, that would be far, far, like very sufficient in terms of understanding what we do. So dissemination is to make the law known. Ignorance of the law is a major obstacle to respecting it. So the ICRC not only spreads uh, and teaches the law, but it studies carefully, among other things, which actors would be arms bearers in armed conflict. It studies the organizational structure of arms bearers, the range of levels of organization. So you might have very hierarchical state-like groups, or you might have uh, decentralized armed groups. And we think about and we implement strategies on how to teach uh, these groups uh, the law, but then also how we can appeal in different ways to make them respect the law. Um, so sometimes just res resorting to the fact that it's international law is sufficient, particularly for state actors, but other times uh, the fact that it's international law might not be so convincing. So we might also try to socialize the norms in IHL through other means, uh, highlighting uh, how IHL and religious doctrines, for example, or moral and ethical uh, uh, obligations overlap with IHL and try to get uh, not only the arms bearers to know the law, but to socialize it so that they have this humanitarian reflex and this reflex to respect the law when an armed conflict breaks out. Um, if you want to know more about this type of work and, and our research on different types of groups and how we disseminate and try to socialize IHL, there's an excellent publication that's free called Roots of Restraint in War. If you Google Roots of Restraint in War, it'll come up and you can get a free PDF of that. And it breaks down with case studies, the different types of armed groups and the different ways that one, including the ICRC, might be able to disseminate and socialize IHL. Um, in addition to dissemination and socialization, we, we also conduct trainings and we assist with the implementation of law. And implementation in terms of public international law parlance means converting treaty law into domestic law. And in certain, uh, uh, certain jurisdictions, that is a necessary step, not only for ratification, but for that law to have effect. So uh, many of our colleagues are uh, speaking to parliamentarians and trying to figure out uh, how best to take the treaty law and implement it into domestic law. We also promote the understanding of law. Uh, primary examples of this are a 2005 study that compiles state practice and try to figure out and try to make clear what are the customary rules under IHL. And we're also updating our commentaries on the Geneva Conventions. Uh, these conventions were drafted in 1949. The commentaries were published shortly thereafter. And many uh, updates, many uh, developments have occurred since then. So we're undertaking a process of updating the commentaries, uh, not only of the Geneva Conventions, but of the additional protocols as well. To date, we have updated the first, second, and third Geneva Convention, still have to do the fourth and the two additional protocols. Finally, uh, the ICRC uh, also develops the law. So it urges states to create law. Emilia went over the first step uh, that this took place in with respect to the 1864 First Geneva Convention. That sort of activity where the ICRC gets states together to come up with a treaty is ongoing. Uh, it took place in 1949. It took place with respect to the additional protocol. And most recently and uh, ongoingly, I don't know if that's a word yet, most recently, uh, we've called on states to try to develop rules relating to autonomous weapons systems. So you may have seen the call from the ICRC for states to begin developing legally binding international rules, perhaps even through a treaty that sets restrictions, spe certain specific restrictions on the use of lethal autonomous weapon systems. So now moving on to what the ICRC does during armed conflict. So um, an armed conflict breaks out, what do we do? Well, the first thing we do internally is we classify the armed conflict. 
is there an armed conflict? If there is, who are the parties to the armed conflict? What type of armed conflict is it? So basically, international humanitarian law is this body of law that is bifurcated. The rules differ depending on whether it's an armed conflict between two states or an armed conflict involving a non-state armed group. And so we have to figure out, is this an international armed conflict or a non-international armed conflict? After we've done so, we send to the parties to the armed conflict, what we call rappel du droit, which uh, in English is a recall of the law, and it shares with them our classification. And depending on the classification, it highlights the applicable rules and what the parties to the armed conflict must respect uh, throughout the armed conflict. After we do that, the ICRC monitors compliance with IHL. We have delegates on the ground in the armed conflict situation, and uh, we monitor potential violations. Based on that monitoring, we have bilateral and confidential dialogue with the parties to the armed conflict. We talk to all sides, including armed groups that might be listed even by the UN as terrorist groups, and including states that might be seen or even determined by the GA, the General Assembly, or the Security Council to be aggressors. Uh, it doesn't matter. We, we talk to all sides and all parties to the armed conflict about uh, compliance with IHL. I mentioned that this is bilateral and confidential. So we never publish reports about violations, and we speak only with the parties of the armed conflict. In other words, the content of these discussions is kept secret. Why is that? So two reasons. First, it allows us to have candid discussions on tough issues with a view towards improving their compliance with IHL. So if you think about it, if there was a risk that the content of these discussions could be public, it would be impossible for parties to the armed conflict to openly talk about the challenges that led to the violations, why the violations happened, what measures they're taking or not taking to address the situation, right? Keeping in mind that some of these violations might also amount to war crimes or other uh, individual or state responsibility that they could be held liable for. So it's very important for the parties to the armed conflict to know that what they discuss with us is not going to be shared. Second reason, remember that the ICRC is double-hatted. Excuse me. So uh, if we were to leak our information or share information publicly about violations in armed conflict, where we're present and where we've witnessed it, of course, parties to the armed conflict would no longer want us there, which would mean it would become impossible for us to continue to assist the victims of armed conflict or conduct our protection activities. Another thing that I have to clarify is we never participate in criminal proceedings. The ICRC has agreements with states concerning privileges and immunities, so delegates of the ICRC will never be called to tribunals or be required to hand over materials. And with international criminal tribunals we have either in their statutes or their procedure and evidence, excuse me, rules regarding procedure and evidence, uh, the same types of immunities, meaning that ICFC delegates won't have to testify, and we won't have to submit our evidence uh, to discussions, uh, to in discovery phase. That said, confidentiality has its limits, right? So if we're doing the bilateral dialogue and we're not seeing any progress, uh, there are a number of options that the ICRC can take. One of them is what we call mobilization, which is to approach third states, particularly those who have influence over the parties to the armed conflict, and try to get them to convince uh, their, uh, the other state, the state that is violating IHL, to change their behavior and respect uh, the law. Finally, if that doesn't work, and when all other options have been exhausted and the ICRC determines that it's in the interest of the victims and those affected by the violations, it will publicly denounce violations of IHL. But this is exceedingly rare. It never happens. It's never happened since I've been with the ICRC. The last time that I know that it's happened was in 2007 with respect to Myanmar. This is really a last resort. So to recap, uh, the ICRC's way of working in armed conflict is really this confidential and bilateral dialogue with the option at times of mobilizing third states and 
Importantly, we say that it's an obligation under IHL, IHL for states to respect and ensure respect for IHL. So we're constantly calling on states to uh, try to bring any states that they have relationships with into compliance with IHL insofar as they have influence over them. So I think that concludes it for me. Thank you very much, Hunter. Uh, and I'm gonna turn off my video and uh, yeah, give it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kasuke. I think I speak for myself and the entire team here for uh, the wonderful, amazing things. Uh, and we just wanna thank you for, for all uh, the perspective you bring from the ICRC and for, uh, for teaching us today. Um, so if, uh, everybody at home can do a little round of applause. Uh, that'd be really wonderful. So now that that's, that, that was the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, so now we're gonna be talking about the American Red Cross and the work that uh, uh, the, so, uh, the organization that I'm a part of uh, does. Uh, so the American Red Cross works in five main areas, disaster relief, uh, life saving blood, uh, training and certification, military families, and international services. So we're going to hear today from uh, the uh, a representative from the Restoring Family Links team, uh, and she'll tell you about what uh, they do. And then you'll hear from the uh, IHL team senior legal uh, advisor, uh, who will be sharing what the team that I'm a part of does in a little more depth than what I said earlier. So I have the uh, pleasure of introducing uh, Jamina Shikani, uh, and sh she will be uh, taking over to introduce what RFL does. Thank you, Hunter. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Again, I'm Jamina Shikani. I'm the Restoring Family Links Officer here at the American Red Cross. Um, and he mentioned those five lines of service at the American Red Cross within the international services line of service. The Restoring Family Links program helps family members locate and reconnect with one another after being separated by humanitarian emergencies, such as armed conflict, disaster, and migration. When tragedy strikes and circumstances force families to flee their homes, loved ones can become separated. And when traditional methods of finding one another aren't available, sometimes these families need help to reconnect. The Red Cross helps thousands of families every year through the Restoring Family Links program. Restoring Family Links services are provided by the Global Red Cross and Red Crescent Network in countries around the world, including right here in the United States. Red Cross, Red Crescent National Societies provide Restoring Family Links services to people in their respective countries. And the International Committee of the Red Cross, who we just heard from ICRC, provides restoring family link services in conflict zones, as mentioned earlier. ICRC has responsibility for visiting persons detained in relation to armed conflicts and political attentions, and they provide RFL services or restoring family link services during those visits. Let's look at the next slide, um, a, a kind of broad overview of our services. Thank you, Hunter. Restoring family link services are free and they fall into four different categories. Tracing is a service where we and our Red Cross Red Crescent partners search for missing loved ones who have either been separated due to a humanitarian crisis or the family has suddenly lost contact with a loved one overseas. Um, maybe the loved one, they suspect that they've become ill or they're vulnerable, um, in which case we may be able to provide a health and welfare check. Family news is the exchange of messages mentioned earlier between family members when there are no other means of communication. We often send family news to and from individuals who are in refugee camps, um, individuals who are migrating or individuals who are detained, and they may have no other way to communicate, um, no communication options that are available to them. The third one, connectivity and phone services, provides phone calls or and or internet access to refugees or migrants that have been separated from their families and need to communicate with their loved ones and let them know they're safe. And uh, finally, requests for documentation primarily involve a person seeking proof of time spent in detention related to armed conflict or political unrest. If the individual was visited by ICRC while they were detained, we can work with ICRC to request documentation of the detention. We also provide services for requests for other wartime documentation 
or other documentation um, such as birth certificates or university uh, diplomas where the ability to access records or documents through conventional avenues is not possible due to disruptions in the infrastructure of a country. There are some limitations to restoring family link services. We can help people get back in communication with each other, but the Red Cross does not have any ability to influence um, bringing people into the United States or expediting that process. Everyone coming to the United States must follow standard immigration procedures. Our services are limited to family members who've lost contact because of conflict or disaster. So we can't open a case for someone who maybe never knew the other person um, or for genealogical purposes. An additional limitation is that tracing services are not available to US citizens who are living or traveling abroad since the US Department of State services for overseas citizens handles those types of requests. Our ability to provide services also depends on the capacity of the receiving Red Cross or Red Crescent National Society to respond to such cases. The next slide is a nice visual showing the global scope of the Restoring Family Links Program. Every year, the Restoring Family Links Program at the American Red Cross works with more than 100 Red Cross, Red Crescent partners around the world. Conflicts have directly or indirectly caused the most family separations, and that generates um, the bulk of our casework, compri comprising about 80% of our caseload here at the American Red Cross. This map reflects the countries the American Red Cross has worked with and attempts to reconnect families, not necessarily where the conflicts or disasters have occurred, as many countries serve as hosts to refugees from areas of conflict. Tracing requests are, an open, are open for recent conflicts like those in Ukraine and Syria, as well as for separations caused by the Cold War and even still we get cases uh, from World War II. I think this program is often best shared through the telling of stories. The next slide, we're gonna look at a story shared by one family, which shows the impact of the Restoring Family Links program. This picture, um, you see two brothers. The photo was taken in Dossai refugee camp in Chad. Their mother left Central African Republic in 2013 because of armed conflict there. And she went to Dossai refugee camp in Chad. Her sons remained in Central African Republic with their father. Um, and in 2018, the mother was resettled to the United States as a refugee. The boys did not know that, that she had been resettled and they thought she was still in that camp in Chad. Um, so they actually walked from their home, from their village to Chad to look for their mother. Their mother eventually came to the Red Cross office in Tucson, Arizona and opened a tracing inquiry to look for her two sons. Um, so you can see again, the, the boys, they're age 12 and 13 in the photo. Um, they were located in Dossai Camp in Chad by our Red Cross colleagues in that country. One of the boys you can see he's holding their mother's photo. This is photo was taken at the Tucson, Arizona office when she opened that tracing inquiry. Once the children were located, the mother made a phone call to her children while at the Red Cross office using our connectivity services and the family was reconnected after years of separation. We hope this uh, small, small time talking about restoring family links gives you a better understanding of the program. I encourage you to learn more and explore information available on redcross.org, um, which includes videos and additional information about the program. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to my IHL colleagues to share more information about that program. Hi everyone. I'm Thomas Harper. I'm the senior legal advisor for the American Red Cross here at National Headquarters in Washington, DC. It's my pleasure to help lead the International Humanitarian Law Program here at the American Red Cross. And as you've heard today, our, our program carries on a legacy that began on that battlefield in Solferino in 1859. My colleague, Christian Jorgensen, our IHL legal advisor here at the IHL program, likes to say that the memory of Solferino was really the first dissemination effort, the first dissemination campaign. It was uh, Mr. Dunant's effort to, to get the word out about what he saw to the globe, what he saw there on the battlefield in Solferino, and really uh, spark a, a call to action uh, to inject some humanity in a really inhumane process that, that is armed conflict. Uh, 
And that tradition, that sort of call to action, if you will, has carried through the entire movement. And we are just the latest chapter in that. All national chapters, uh, all national societies of the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, all 192 of them share in this dissemination mission. Uh, we're just a cog in that larger machine. And our program here, our mission and our mandate is to disseminate IHL to the American people. And that includes uh, those on serving overseas and their families at U.S. military bases abroad in places like Korea, Japan, Germany, Italy, and elsewhere. Uh, we do that mission, we accomplish that mission through two main means. The first is our IHL dissemination program. This is an offshot of that. This is an example of that dissemination program in action. It's adult oriented uh, to, to those uh, sort of uh, at the end of their college years and, and older, although many of our programs do appeal to, to folks of all ages. And then the second arm of our program is the Youth Action Campaign, which is really focused on those uh, young professionals aged 13 uh, to 24, uh, reaching up into the, the uh, sort of postgraduate or graduate school years. We accomplish that goal of dissemination, not just through those age groups, but in a variety of ways. And I'm proud to, to say that this program is volunteer led, like so much of what the Red Cross and Red Crest movement is. We rely on volunteers just like yourself. There are many of our volunteers sitting in the audience right now who are helping execute this mission day in, day out. Folks who come and get certified as IHL instructors and, and go out and teach classes just like this in their communities. Folks who serve as youth action campaign advocates, young adults, young professionals with no legal background who are learning about IHL and teaching about it to their classmates, their friends, their family members, and their community members. Truly, it, it is a, a, an operation that is done uh, person by person, because as Kasuke really poignantly mentioned there, ignorance of the law is, is a real danger. It threatens the very legitimacy of the rule of law, of the, the, uh, the, the lifespan of IHL. And by sitting here and listening to a presentation like this, by volunteering out in your community, even if it's nothing more than, than just speaking to people about the existence of IHL, the existence of these rules on the battlefield and their role in reducing suffering. That is making a difference because an informed person, someone who, who knows more about the law, is that much more able to advocate that all sides during an armed conflict abide by their responsibilities under IHL and therefore help in the ultimate goal of reducing human suffering during armed conflict. Because we may never, as, as aspirational as it is to hope that uh, warfare between humans ends, we may never accomplish that goal. But what we can do is ensure the enduring legacy of Mr. Dunant and the entire body of IHL by helping spread its, its uh, information, help spread uh, word about its existence and its function wide, as widely as possible. So I want to thank you for playing an important part. It's not often that you get to spend your lunch hour uh, helping uh, achieve something under the Geneva Conventions, but you've done uh, that here today. So I thank you. And we can go to the next slide. If you are interested in coming before I kick it back over to, to Hunter to close us out, I want to say thank you, first of all, to uh, Hunter, to Amelia, to Kasuke, and to Jamina for putting on an outstanding presentation. This really is a momentous occasion every year. It's uh, the incredible body of work that the entire movement does all across the globe each and every day is really tremendous and heartening. It certainly gets, uh, keeps me motivated coming to work every day. And I wanna thank the four of you for helping uh, continue that legacy here in this great presentation today. If you have other questions, you want to get involved, if you want to know about the events that we have coming up, you can use your, the, the camera on your smartphone if you have one of those to scan that QR code down in the bottom left of your screen. We'll get your information. It's a basic form that you fill out with your name, your email, and your zip code. We'll put you onto our mailing list so that you are made aware of, of our future events. We have several great ones coming up. Uh, up next on May 18th at 9.30 a.m., we have the first in a new series on environmental protections during wartime. We're going to be joined by Ambassador Marja Leto of the UN International Law Commission. She's going to be talking about 
the UN uh, principles for protection of the environment during armed conflict. We'll also have several other really great guests joining us to discuss how these rules uh, play out in real life, how they operate to protect the environment, challenges uh, that, that exist to implementing these rules. You'll also see part two of that event on May 25th at noon. We're gonna have a couple additional panels in that second part of our series, and that'll be on May 25th at noon. On May 24th, we have another great pop culture event uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern and noon Eastern, where we're gonna be talking IHL issues in video games. And I'm not talking about war video games like Call of Duty or Battlefield. We're talking things like Law of War issues and things like Mario Kart or Star Fox. How can we better understand uh, IHL through the lens of games that many of us have grown up with? You can also email us. Uh, Christian Jorgensen, as I, I mentioned earlier, is the, the leader of our IHL dissemination program. You can email him below if you are interested in opportunities on that side. If you're interested in youth action campaign opportunities, you can email our program officer, Larissa Hatch, at her email below, larissa.hatch at redcross.org. And again, if you scan that QR code, you can get signed up for, for uh, all of these great events or you get signed up to, to learn more about these great events and what we have coming up. Hunter, back over to you and thank you to everyone for attending. Thomas did a great job of wrapping us up. Uh, so I just wanna say once again, thank you for coming uh, and have a great rest of your world, Red Cross and Red Crescent Day. Bye, y'all.